Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome here on this rainy night to my desk in the mountain village of Aula in Tuscany, Italy. On YouTube, you can find various versions uh, of a talk called The End of Space-Time by Nima Arkani Hamid. I want to summarize some brief points that Arkani Hamid makes before moving on to make uh, some further observations to carry forward the theme. Now, he mentions that in the past decade, quote, new mathematical structures in combinatorics, number theory, and geometry that in concrete examples can be seen to give rise to the rules of space-time and quantum mechanics. Right? So, he's talking about the combinatorial S-matrix or, or, or scattering matrix, right? So th these are the possible ways, right? That for instance, gluons interact, right? So the, and the permutations, right? Involving, let's say, two gluons interacting with one gluon or one gluon interacting with two gluons and all the possible ways that can happen, right? So this is the domain of combinatorics, all possible combinations of some series, some set. All right. So, uh, th these then produce three particle amplitudes, right? So the, these triadic configurations, right, then amalgamate into more complex structures. Right? And the pieces, the individual building blocks, he says, don't have right, space time or quantum uh, mechanical interpretation, but the full volume does, right? And in a very precise sense, the rules of space time and quantum mechanics arise as derivatives or de derivative notions from this more uh, abstract mathematical structures, right? Now, he, he, he emphasizes that the fluctuations, right, these different scattering uh, patterns, right, aren't occurring in space-time, right? Uh, now, regarding this, the, the, the amplitude Right. The, the, as he said, the individual building blocks of the amalgamations have no uh, space time or quantum mechanical uh, or quantum mechanics. Right. So the volume of the shape of the amalgamated shape, right, gives us the amplitude for the scattering processes. Right. So in a sense, right, you could correlate or view these amplitudes of the scattering processes, right, as on the way to, to matter. Right. And so then what you uh, think of is uh, information structures that produce matter in information physics theories. Right. And um, so so then geometry is produced by permutations of the scattering processes. Right. So you're on the way for, from these mathematical structures to geometrical patterns, right, then on to you know, the matter and all those entities that comprise uh, the cosmos. Now, the, the permutations, one way you can think about them is, the, uh, uh, as uh, Arkani Hamid points out, right, you can line up the numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 on, a on the bottom, and on top of that, another set of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. The bottom, right, represents space. The top line represents time. Now, for instance, you could then correlate the 1, draw a line, go up to 4, Right, and maybe on the bottom, the, the 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 number five then goes up in a line and correlates with number three, right, etc. So you're going to get all these crisscrossing lines, right? And all the various possibilities of those are the permutations of the of these uh, of these uh, S matrix, right? The scattering matrix, scattering uh, possibilities, if you will. And this represents. Um, one dimension plus one dimension. We have one dimension space, one dimension time in there. But this can be generalized, right, to fit the three plus one dimensions of our actual world. Right? So that's very important, right? And, and these mathematical structures of the combinatorial permutations give rise to both the space time and the quantum mechanics. Again, another, um, this, this is the main point of his talk is that space time and quantum mechanics may be generated by something that is more primitive. And what he's suggesting is that this what is more primitive are the scattering processes and the combinatorial uh, structures, the mathematical structures, right, that, that represent these. 
Um, there are some problems, admittedly, right, with this model. He doesn't uh, go into it much in his talk on YouTube, but in the book that he published with some colleagues called the Grassmannian uh, Geometry of, of um, uh, let's see what the title of it was, the Grassmannian uh, ge Geometry of Scattering Amplitudes, that's, excuse me, uh, published by Springer. He points out that, uh, quote, we have yet to see right, locality and unitarity fully emerge from more primitive principles in a completely satisfactory way. Right. And so the locality and the unitarity, of course, are the two foundations, the, found, found, the pillars right, uh, of quantum field theory. Right? So some things still need to be worked out. But anyway, uh, what you can discern in this, now I'm going to go beyond uh, what, what uh, Arkani Ahmed has to say, but what what he the model he's proposing that mathematical structures uh, 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 comprising these combinatorial sets, right, uh, are what comprise right or give rise to space time and quantum mechanics, right. This is uh, congruent with the Neo Pythagorean or sort of a Platonic mathematical structures right model that you know, has, has math numbers, algorithms, uh, numerical patterns, mathematical structures, right, giving rise to and comprising the cosmos, right? And, you know, th th there are ancient uh, anticipations of this, for instance, right, in the, not only in the, the Greco-Roman literature, but also in like the Sefer Yetzirah, the Book of Formation, right, which had a huge impact uh, on Jewish mysticism. But the fact is that the, the Sefer Yetzirah, right, is uh, just not a mystical treatise. It's also an attempt at an ancient scientific uh, explanation of the universe. You know, how does the universe arise, right? So, uh, you know, you think of, Alchemy, pre-scientific alchemy, was a combination of, you know, the predecessors to scientific chemistry, right, merged, of course, with that time's uh, ideas in religion, mysticism, magic, even, etc. Right, same thing for astrology, right? So the predecessor to astronomy, right? Merged with some religious ideas at that time. And this is what Sefer Yetzirah does. And um, even you can see that, uh, you know, the the, uh, <clears throat> the the gluon, right? Scattering matrix that, that Arkani Hamid talks about, right? So the possibilities, right? You have either two gluons account interacting with a one uh, gluon or one gluon interacting with two gluons, right? And then it scatters in this triadic con configuration <clears throat> and, com com uh, and gives rise to this triadic uh, pattern. All right, so you think of Sefer Yetzirah, uh, its explanation for the universe is that everything is built out of various combinations, right, of the divine letters, which function also as numbers, of course, because, right, in Hebrew, for instance, the first letter of the alphabet, Aleph, functions as the number one. The second letter of the alphabet, Beit, functions as the number two, etc. Right, and so um, the the underlying configuration involves three letters. The first three letters of the sacred tetragrammaton, Yod, He, Vav. Right. So not all four uh, letters of the full tetragrammaton, Yod, He, Vav, He, or Yod, He, Vav, He, but Yod, He, Vav. Right, and we're not quite sure why the Sefi Yetzirah, you know, starts with three, uh, though there's some clues in the text. But in any case, uh, right, if you consider this symbolically or metaphorically, it, it does make sense because what the understanding of the Yod Hey Vav of this divine name is that it was coordinated with, correlated with, right, the Hebrew verb of being, the copula of the verb of being. So, right. The universe is, how do you explain what is? Well, what uh, <clears throat> on some higher level, um, the power of isness, of existence, what gives rise to things, right, is represented by the divine name that denotes being, Yodevavhe, right? Because it's uh, you know understood to be a form, a very peculiar form of, of the verb of being. So if you understand it, uh, symbolically, you can see why it can even be used in one of these pre-modern uh, mystical scientific treatises like the Sefer Yetzirah.
All right, so it's not that Sefer Yetzirah was, was anticipating, you know, modern ideas like um, Arkani Hamidis, right, uh, that the, the S matrix <clears throat> uh, permutations, right, and, and these triadic uh, configurations that then, right, give rise to larger amalgamations, right, can then explain, right, the origins of space-time and quantum mechanics. No, uh, but you can look at the similarities in the Sefer Yetzirah and, and say, all right, so we can see that as a parable, as an analogy, as a metaphor, right, for what science is, is, is telling us. Right, and so uh, you have the you also take into account right the impact of religious ideas in the history of science, right? So many scientific scientific ideas right through through the many centuries in Western civilization, for instance, right, were inspired by certain religious ideas that were then applied to a different field of knowledge, right? The hard sciences, for instance, right, and um, uh, but. Now, if you try now, uh, Stanislav uh, Krajewski, right, uh, he's explained that mathematical models that are used in religion, right, are uh, are sometimes fine, uh, so long as they function as metaphors, right, to illustrate a certain idea, but these mathematical models in religion are not productive of new knowledge, right, the way that we see, uh, you know the hard sciences being productive, right? And certain models leading to new knowledge, right? So this doesn't happen when we take these, uh, like, like von Kusa's mathematical models in religion, right? It's a nice uh, illustration of something that was already known. It doesn't lead to new, uh, f new knowledge, new models of knowledge, right? Um, there was an interchange with, uh, between uh, Arkani Hamadi and a sociologist after uh, one of his presentations on this end of space time and the, and um, uh, Arkani Hamadi made the point that right physics is uh, is aiming for the absolute truth but it it can never arrive at truth as such the absolute truth we just have approximations ever uh, ever more sharp uh, approximations approaching truth as such, but truth as such is beyond uh, the scientific method, right? And the sociologist then retorted that this is a, a, a theological notion at its root, the idea of truth as such. And uh, I think uh, uh, Arkani Hamidi then made something, some comment about, his, you know, that his approach is atheistical. Uh, but be that as it may, it's, it's ultimately irrelevant because the sociologist's point was, in fact, correct. If you look at it just from a historical angle, right, that the idea of absolute truth to which you cannot arrive, but you, you, do, you can approximate, right, and arrive at closer approximations of that, that's, that's, that, emanate, that originates from uh, theology, right, uh, historically speaking. Right, and of course, it's uh, uh, Arkani Hamidi is not using it in a theological sense, right? But you know, the language and the basic underlying concept does come from Western uh, theology, right? So, you know, the truth as such is not the domain of science or the hard sciences, right? So, because uh, like physics, for instance, it does not tell us what the cosmos is. Tells us how it functions. Does not tell us what space is, right? Tells us how it functions. Um, and this brings me to another presentation you can find on YouTube by Sabina Hassenfelder, a physicist, right? So it's called the, "Did the Big Bang uh, Happen?" Right, and has a subtitle you see on the screen. It's like we don't know how the universe began, right? So, and there I want to do a few quotes uh, that she offers. Right, most physicists think that the Big Bang singularity is a mathematical artifact and not what really happened. It probably just means that Einstein's theory stops working. Right, all we can say is that if we extrapolate Einstein's equations back in time, we get the Big Bang singularity. We think this isn't physically correct, so we don't know how the universe began, and that's it. Right. When it comes to the question, I'm continuing her, her quote, 
later on in the talk, when it comes to the question how the universe began, we are facing the limits of scientific science itself. It's a question I think we'll never be able to answer. Right? Unquote. So, uh, you know, all these ideas that the universe began uh, as a, you know, from a black hole or from a, a zero size universe that then transitions into the universe we have now, right, with this transition phase of the Big Bang. All of this, um, we could call it, uh, and here I'm borrowing uh, a point from Hausenfelder again, and said that these are creation myths written in the language of a mathematics, right? So to, 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 uh, to start wrapping this up, Hausenfelder then says, quote, the Big Bang is the simplest explanation we know, and that is probably wrong. And that's it. That's all science can tell us, unquote, right? So there are, we do reach limits, right? Uh, like the, the, the Higgs field, the Higgs is not a particle, a God particle, for instance, right? Higgs is a field that enables the particles right, to attain different degrees of mass. But in any case, uh, the Large Hadron Collider has not found anything more fundamental than the Higgs. We probably reach the limit. Ultimately, you reach that. There's Hig. There's nothing beyond the Higgs. That's the end of the model, we, we, right? Or like the unified field theory that Einstein tr uh, died try, trying to finish. Didn't finish it. No one has finished it since. Well, maybe we've hit the limit. We, maybe it's the physical fact that the four forces actually cannot be unified. Right? That's a possi d definite possibility. Anyway, so if we reach the limit and we cannot know how, what, how the universe began, well, we certainly can't work our way back before the beginning, right? Which is a analogical metaphorical language, right? Because before the beginning of space-time, you can't talk about it before. There's no time right? or, or a causality. So that is not the domain of physics. And any, any good physicist will admit or tell you, and he should have been trained to, he or she should have been trained to know, right? That that's uh, outside, the, like the question was a God, right? Behind the Big Bang. So this is beyond the competence of physicists, it's outside their field, right? The, the, they're neither comp they're competent neither to affirm it or to deny it. It's, it's, it's of no concern in that field. It should be left to the theologians, to analytical philosophers and, and to philosophers right and so um, with that uh, i'll end and uh, say if you found anything of interest in this talk uh, please subscribe to the channel and consider a donation to support us in our work here if you find it of interest right uh, through paypal or patreon uh, thank you very much